Web3, it's an interesting time for the market. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows it's you know the bear market. Um, I actually wanted to start with you, Alice. Uh, you recently launched a company that's not not Web3 specific, but you know Web3 adjacent. It makes use of the you know the underlying uh, technology. Um, you had a very interesting path, I would say, to to getting where you are. Tell us how you you came to, to launch the company. Um, why now? And then how are NFTs and how is Web3 actually you know, involved here? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alice, um, and I'm the founder and CEO of Psyche. Um, so we are a few things, but primarily we're a community of people who are focused on emerging designers, specifically to digital designers. And we have a membership pass that's an NFT called the Keystone that gives you access to that community. We're also in build mode for a platform at the moment, which is the Psyche platform, which we see as Almost in the simplest terms, think of it as a digital closet, as well as a marketplace, as well as a social environment, because we think that's really, really important. Um, and the reason I left my job as Chief Digital Officer at Ralph Lauren to do this um, is yes, A. By the way, you, you had a pretty good job. I had a great <laughs> job, a great job, an amazing company. You know, I left advertising at an incredible company as well when social media started, because I really believed in the space. And I think. There's three things that I think are fundamentally important to why Psyche and many companies like this need to exist. Um, one is digital worlds are real. You know, the metaverse is real. I think you only have to look at the engagement figures on Roblox to um, consider that that might be, might be true, as well as um, many of you may not know, Yuga Lab's other side that has been built at the moment. Look at some of the revenue that's been generated around the excitement for that. I think that in these spaces, people care as much about their identity in digital worlds as they do the physical world. And again, there's a few amazing data points to show that, right? Look at Fortnite, their revenue that we found out in 2019 from their apparel and skin sales, more than the revenue of some of the most major fashion brands that we know today. And I think that's really important. But if people want to exist in these spaces and showcase their identities, they also want to own their assets. We like to own things in the physical world. They're ours. We can rent, absolutely lease. But ownership is a fundamentally important concept to us as human beings. And we think that blockchain is the best way to enable ownership and that digital fashion has a really important future with blockchain. There will be centralized versions of this and decentralized. We are decentralized and we're building on Ethereum as well as Polygon. Um, but that's kind of where we sit today. Could you explain quickly, like, why is blockchain the best way to enable ownership of a digital asset for, yeah. for people who might not so, be familiar? So, you know, for us um, personally, I, I actually recommend you all check out an exciting project called 10KTF, specifically related to some of the work they did with board aids. But um, it is absolutely yours. It does not sit on a centralized system. So I'm going to give you, and I, by the way, I'm a big fan of some of the centralized digital fashion places as well, like a Roblox, did incredible work with them. And we saw amazing results back in Ralph Lauren. But I think when I bought that bag on Roblox, I actually have to leave it on Roblox. It no longer belongs to me. It belongs ultimately to Roblox. And I think that it's great when I'm in Roblox, and that's really fantastic. But if I want to take it off platform, that I know Robert is speaking later, later with Gucci, but I own a Gucci bag on Roblox. It's impossible, and there's an interoperability thing that needs to be solved with that, but also the ownership of it is not on something like the blockchain, which is a distributed ledger, almost owned by everyone in many ways, but I'll let Brian speak a little bit more about that. And it is immutable, and it is fully transparent, and I think that's really, really important. Think about the physical world, right? We all live today, and we'll go out on the street, and there's public infrastructure that is owned by the US government, perhaps, but by everyone. You go on the street, it's public. And then private enterprise sits on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a private restaurant or something like this that generates revenue. And um, I think of the blockchain as like the public infrastructure that people start to build on. And actually, the early internet came from a very public infrastructure as well. That now we interact with it through something like Google, right? Your search engine, Facebook, right? One of your social platforms, Instagram. The thing is, on those platforms, you don't actually own your data or own your assets. And I think we've seen what happens at times when centralized companies have made decisions around your assets or your data, or being a brand back in 2011 and trying to acquire Facebook likes. We all remember that and how important they were and what we put into it. And then actually how that flipped on its head because of revenue model around advertising. 
Um, so I think it's really, really important uh, to distinguish between those things. But I do want to say that both are important. I'm not an absolute decentralization maximalist. Um, I believe in centralized systems and centralized entities as well as decentralized. And for us right now, blockchain and Ethereum is where we're building. We're, we're, gonna, we're definitely coming back to this topic of owning data. Um, yeah. Brian, I wanted to jump over to you really quickly. Uh, in, in your role, you work closely with a lot of brands. Um, and I was curious, you know, what's, what's the environment like? Are brands, are they pulling back from Web3? Um, are they still investing? You know, what's, what's the atmosphere like as well? Like, what are you seeing? I think the answer is yes to both of your two questions. People are pulling back, but people are investing. It depends on where they are on the spectrum of education to execution. Meaning if folks are still at the educa uh, education stage, you know, um, doing research either internally or through agencies, um, they may have cut budgets um, and pulled back a little bit. Whereas folks who have beefed up and built out teams um, to execute against the Web3 strategy, who have had that requisite education, they're doubling down and they're building. And um, something that we say in Web3 is that it's not so much a bear market, it's a build market. And there might be some you know, copium in that phrase a little bit. I'm very aware of that. Um, but I think it's a, a very interesting way of highlighting the folks who are building the tools and primitives for tomorrow. Are there, are there certain use cases that brands are interested in? Because I imagine not everyone is launching you know, JPEGs at this point and expecting to you know, make a killing on them. What are, what are some of the other things that brands are looking to do? Yeah, you know, Verbal did uh, an incredible job talking about the hyper-financialization of NFTs and, and some of these um, tokens and, and you know, uh, decentralized primitives. For me, what's more interesting um, are NFTs as assets that you earn, not so much uh, as assets that you invest in. Uh, and I take the view that over time, uh, NFTs will trend towards zero in terms of the average price of an NFT. And that's not to be like a doomer statement that these are not valuable assets. It's meant to highlight the fact that we are pacing towards a world where folks are earning NFTs as sort of a signifier of their loyalty for engaging with a brand. And much the same way that cookies track you around the internet, uh, your crypto wallet will have millions of NFTs in them. Um, that are inherently valueless on the secondary market uh, unless it's representative of a unique brand experience um, that sort of uh, accrues value over time, right? So uh, in a world where you have, uh, to Verbal's point, he was talking about Bored Apes and Azuki's, some of these are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, but there's only one of them, and I have a million NFTs that were issued to me by brands um, that are inherently worth zero, um, that's what I mean by saying that NFTs will trend towards zero. But to answer your question very directly and put a bow on top, um, loyalty, subscriptions, rewards, token gating, um, those are the interesting use cases that I cannot talk to a brand for more than 30 seconds before they bring up those use cases. Milton, I wanted to get your opinion. You, you have a little bit of a different perspective on Web3. Um, and so I just wanted to, to hear from you, you know, what are some of the things that you see that are really valuable there? And where are some of the areas where you think, like, you might not need a blockchain for that? Well, the original intent of Web3 was to decentralize the web, to empower individuals with their identity, their personal data. How many of you know that you own, as an asset, the data that you create on Google and on Instagram? How many of you know that? I tried that at many business schools, and zero of those best and the brightest knew that. That's your asset. So the original Web 3, as I read it five years ago, uh, was privacy, but then it was about taking control of your identity so no one can impersonate you online, and no one can impersonate celebrities so you know that that, e that message is coming from a, an authentic person, that you can take control of your data, you can download it from all these uh, digital sources, from these platforms. You can combine it with your own personal data that you generate on, on your phone. Take your own personal data container, have AI work on your own device, generate insights that enhance your life, not the advertiser's life, that give you recommendations that are personal, private, and enhance your life. And then thirdly, which is not often talked about, that you can take control of your digital relationships. Think of Taylor Swift. If she's on a platform and the platform doesn't like what she just said, they can shut her out. And now she doesn't have control of that 100 million of fans. She'd have to start all over. So to me, Web3 has always been about taking control of your identity digitally, taking control of your data, and doing whatever you want with it. You want to delete it? You want to hoard it? You want to monetize it? That's your choice. That's your freedom. 
And then thirdly, you take control of your relationships. And that to me is what Web3 uh, is all about, and I'm investing in five different companies. The technology we don't have to get into, whether blockchain or not blockchain, you don't need blockchain for many things. You can use blockchain for others. And then there's other technology we're not going to get into called zero knowledge proofs that will help you to get even greater control. So to me, as an investor, those are the kind of the pure, uh, the, that's the pure purpose of Web3. And I like to work on that space that I call creator empowerment technology. Um, one of the threads here is, is definitely identity, whether you're talking about it from a data perspective um, or, Alice, you're approaching it from a, a very different perspective. Uh, you know, we're talking about how you present yourself, like visually present yourself in an online world. Why do you think that's become so important and how is that going to evolve? I mean, are, is it going to become more important is what we currently have with, you know, you have like a little avatar or like a profile picture on Twitter. Is that the extent of the online identity that we need or do you see it evolving in some way? Yeah, I think um, my personal opinion is I definitely see it evolving. And I think there's a number of reasons why. You know, back in 2020, we did a partnership at Ralph Lauren with Bitmoji where we um, created a, a wardrobe for people's Bit Bitmojis, you know, just to kind of test out were people interested in digital fashion and could it be a proof of concept? And tens of millions of people wanted to showcase a version of their identity, which was exhibited through a brand, Ralph Lauren, that they know and love and wanted to put it on their Bitmoji. And you're right, there's profile picture projects, you know, a lot of the, the profile picture projects that like I, you know, initially fell in love were super 2D that are evolving into the 3D. But we're getting to a tipping point, and I think it's number one is with technology. I think there was a great talk very, at the very start of the day about gaming, right? And how you're seeing these kind of virtual worlds be built. And the technology is, is really becoming quite astounding. And I think we're going to move beyond just gaming instances of it, right? I think there'll be much more social applications, which you're seeing in, at Fortnite today. I also think the tools are getting really interesting. I mean, Blender, I don't know if anyone knows Blender, um, Unity and Unreal, but the fact that Blender is a free t tool that creators can come on board and start building in and creating the most incredible fashion designs and identity design of like seen before, that, that was impossible 15 years ago. And now they're publishing them to platforms so that people can buy into them and wear them to express themselves. I think that gets really interesting. And ultimately, and I always go back to the physical world because I think we learn from it, right? As a species, it's where we've existed um, from the beginning of time. You know, we all have different ways to express our identity completely, be it through fashion or any other way that you want. You're not confined by the physical world anymore once you get into digital worlds. And that's not to say it's going to subsume and eat all of the physical world. It's going to be analogous. But what will be really, really important is those things that maybe you wanted to express, be it a butterfly, you know, you've always wanted to be a butterfly. Like you are not confined in the same way physically. And I think that the tools, so the blenders, the technologies and their evolution, like the Fortnite kind of getting more expansive um, and your ability to express yourselves in those spaces will inevitably um, be a huge, huge part of the future. I think it's it's only going to get easier too with uh, generative AI. Um, yeah. I don't know if, if people have played around uh, you know, it's not just inserting prompts to generate images. Um, if you don't know how to code, you can have like chat GPT essentially uh, code for you. Yeah. Um, I've seen some pretty cool experiments with people like creating virtual spaces, not knowing how to code. Uh, you know, that's, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's only getting easier. Um, Brian, I wanted to ask you, you know, we've talked about this idea of owning data. Um, Right now, it's like, so as Milton said, like, technically, yeah, you own your data. But in, in reality, um, you know, all the big tech companies are, are using your data, uh, wh whether or not you want them to, essentially. Um, do you see that flipping in some way as a result of Web3? And, like, and, and what would that mean for brands in that case? Yeah, I, I do. Um, and I think it really starts with um, what can one do with his or her own data and what sort of composable things do Web3 enable one to do. Um, so that's why loyalty and rewards are, are sort of like dead center on this issue. And I'll, I'll give an example to sort of like elaborate on, on what I'm trying to get to here. And um, that's to say, 
one could have an on-chain history represented by tokens that they acquire as NFTs for having engaged in digital, digital and physical experiences that can unlock further digital and physical experiences that essentially uh, earmark you as uh, some sort of target to who is essentially an advertiser to give you that experience. So um, using myself as an example, um, born and raised in New York, educated in New York, uh, have run businesses in New York, continue to live here. Uh, I enjoy eating at Carbone. I, I like going to Carbone. I can't get a reservation there. And it drives me mad. And I'm not the type of person to wake up six weeks in advance at 8 o'clock in the morning and try to get that reservation. Now, if Carbone could identify me without the, the sort of like, um, let's call it meat space, social coordination, like waste of me meeting people at Carbone and developing these relationships, which is, it, it takes a long time to do that, right? If they could read my on-chain history, if all of these credentials were earmarked as NFTs in my crypto wallet and they could read that, and reward me with that reservation that I want, that would be a great example of how the paradigm is being uh, shifted and flipped and how by me owning my data and having it readable by would-be advertisers kind of changes the entirety uh, of this ad tech space. Carbone, if you're listening, you clearly yeah, please. a Web3 loyalty program. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for the vodka sauce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Milton, I've, I've spoken to you about data before, uh, and I think you have an interesting perspective on where things are heading. And, you know, again, like coming back to this idea of, of how you own data and, and your identity um, and your relationships, where do you see the space evolving? Um, and, and how does that change how brands interact with customers? So I mentioned before that you do have the power, the technology exists to create your own personal data container on your device, right? Backed up to the cloud, the AI acts on your data and maybe even the anonymous data of cohorts. So you're kind of a platform of one. And inside, it's generating insights. Some of those insights are private to you, like my dating life or my medical life. You may choose to then, because you're a platform of one, license your insights to brands. So brands are gonna have a personal data relationship with their customers and prospects. How does that work? Well, let's say it would say, you know, male 45 to 55, income tier one, net worth tier two, uh, interested in certain colors or certain, you know, fashion, whatever. That would be inside my device. I would license that to brands in several ways. One. Brands can give me rewards or personalize, that's a reward unto itself, for me providing insights or for me listening to their communication or to their ads. So you're licensing your attention. You can also license your intent to buy. Because who knows more when you want to buy, instead of predicting it, I'm just going to tell you I want to buy. Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Bottega. So that personal and direct data relationship with prospects, because they're authenticated, remember, and with customers, because you have a relationship with them, means that you get much richer, relevant, real-time data to personalize for them. And that works in medical, it works in finance, and of course, it works in fashion. Personal data relationships, I think, are the future with rewards, with fair value, with privacy, but your data doesn't leave your device. Insights leave your device to provide to brands, because you don't need to know what year I was born to sell me a great suit, right? But you do need certain things, and I'm willing to give them to you, and this is where it's critical, because I trust you. Because you've guaranteed me privacy and personalization. And I think that's where, it, hopefully, it winds up. So, so I'm going to... We're going to tread lightly here. We don't want to get too deep into the technology part of this uh, and get kind of you know lost in it. But but Milton, do you need a blockchain to do this? No, in that you can build, you can get a personal data container on your device. You know, Apple already gathers a lot of your data. There's no blockchain involved there. Uh, AI, ChatGPT is getting better and better, but it can work on your data and the data of cohorts without boiling the ocean, right? You don't need to scrape the entire internet to serve Milton Pedraza, right? So I think that uh, the tech, you, blockchain has great uses, but it's only one tool of Web3. There's zero knowledge proofs, which this gentleman who's a lawyer is an expert on. I'm not an expert, but what I can say is the technology keeps evolving. So stay tuned for, but the core principles of 
data identity, controlling your identity, taking control and monetizing or doing whatever you want with your data, and taking control of your relationships will all be supported by these emerging technologies. Brian, from your perspective, does, does this genuinely work without blockchain? I think that's a very nuanced question. I think the audience probably can tell I'm going to say no and that Milton and I have discussed this before. <laughs> um, our take on it is that um, you need a blockchain because the data needs to be posted to a censorship resistant, tamper proof uh, uh, ledger um, that anyone can verify against that you can bake privacy into. Um, so it, it's not so much that it needs to exist only on a device, a device that is um, not censorship resistant, that is not tamper proof, uh, also, there's the question of where was the data originated? If it wasn't originated on a blockchain, where did that data come from? Is that data real? Who has tampered with that data? Um, th those are the sorts of questions that we wrestle with uh, when we speak about how blockchain um, increases this sort of experience of owning your own data. So um, to, to wrap that up, it's that uh, blockchains provide a, a censorship resistant and, and tamper proof way of storing this data that you could bake privacy into as opposed to having privacy live on the device solely. Alice, your company is working um, both with centralized platforms and it's you know uh, NFT friendly, as you mentioned before. I'm curious, you know, from your point of view, when somebody is buying digital assets, um, you said ownership is inherently important. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit of a struggle right now with with like fashion NFTs, for instance, is there's not really a place to see them. Um, and that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's part of what you're, you're trying to build. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious from your point of view, you know, if you, if you think about Web3 in, in like, uh, compared to like the history of the internet, where are we? Are we like pre-browsers? And what, where in that analogy does, does your company fit? What are you trying to build exactly? That's a really great question. So in terms of where we are, like Web3 versus early internet, because we discussed that, I feel like that is such a debate and I don't think I will give you the right answer right now. My perspective is, um, I kind of think we're, I, I don't know if we're pre-browser because I think wallets are really interesting in that sense. And I think that wallets are hubs of your identity, right? Depending in terms of like what you've bought on it, what you hold, you know, what PFP projects that you have. So I'm not sure we're quite pre-browser, but I do think, and I'm a little grateful for, the noise has washed out of the system. Unrealistic valuations have kind of settled. You know, I think people who are, and it's really important to see this space as an investment asset class. By the way, in 2018, like owning a luxury handbag was a great asset class to own. But I think what we're seeing is a lot of like that, like hyper financialization that you were speaking to fall out a little bit and people are now building. And I think the next three to five years, it's going to be staggering what we see as a result of that. Because even think about like, you know, browser internet and now like from a desktop perspective and I'll layer mobile on top of that, right? Like those two still coexist in a very real way, right? But mobile internet on top of browser, separate to browser internet enabled Instagram, TikTok, WeChat, huge infrastructural like social platforms and commercial platforms that instigated so much change in the digital world in the last 10 to 15 years. And I think that we're still, we're really in that 2010, 11 stage right now. Um, but we're building to be at that intersection, you know, because something like the other side, which is, again, I go back to this like Yuga Labs project because I think it's really interesting. Um, and back to the Gucci example where I have a Roblox handbag, but I also have a 10 KTF um, Gucci vault project, like bringing that into the other side with me as it's built and created, which is coming. I don't know if anyone's seen the tests. It looks amazing. And um, I think these worlds are happening and I think they're real. And I think that um, it's going to be a really important part of it. But where are we? I, I um, don't want to get it too wrong, but I think probably around 2010, 2011. And I think wallets are the, one of the biggest enablers. And I think we all know that you, the UX, and you, I don't know if anyone's minted on Bitcoin yet, scary experience, you know, but a good experience. Um, it's still so early in the user experience side too. And I think that needs to be improved a lot. But I think the builders who are building today are focused on that. Um, we're, we're running low on time, but I kind of wanted to put the same question to the, the two of you. Milton, where in the evolution of, of, uh, of Web3 are we essentially? I think we're near an inflection point where so many forces like privacy legislation, cookie less, and several, and the advent of all this technology is going to create a break in the platforms. I told you my prediction is the platforms will be utilities in the future, 
and the real brands will be the celebrities. You see it with Ryan Reynolds, you see it with Rihanna, you see it with The Rock. And they can create their own games or whatever other utilities they can do or their own ticketing with all these platforms that will become really utilities. And we're gonna flip that model, I predict, within the next three to five years. And then Brian, same to you, where are we? You know, I, I'll conflate Web3 with Metaverse for one second. I don't usually do that, but I think it's convenient for this case because Citi put out a report earlier this year that the metaversal economy, however they defined it, by 2030 could reach 10 trillion. Um, so from 2022 to 2030, um, or 2023, I can't believe we're already in 2023, uh, those seven years will probably feel like 50 years in terms of the amount of change mm -hmm. and utility and composability that we see in these new technologies. So. Um, I, I think that that report might actually be quite modest. I, might, I actually think that the metaversal economy will be larger than that. Um, and I think that ironically, that we're sort of like still in the first inning, but we're so much further along um, than we think. And that by um, the next administration or the current administration um, uh, getting into their, their next uh, office uh, comes, comes around, I think that like the advancements that we'll make in blockchain and Web3 are, will be tremendous. All right, um, we're out of time. Thank you so much, I really appreciate right. it. Appreciate it, thank you.